Hello, everyone. My name is Chiara Bodini. I am from Bologna, Italy. I am a medical doctor and I have been an activist for the people's health movement in the past, uh, I guess, at least 15 years. Um, I've been a coordinator for the European region of the movement and um, and now my my role in the movement is to coordinate the development of a publication which is called the Global Health Watch, um, which we hope will be ready in its sixth edition in a year or so. My role as a medical doctor is, uh, is in public health um, and I am involved in a group in Bologna that's called Center for International and Intercultural Health, um, where we work uh, medical professionals and, and, and social scientists and anthropologists trying to um, address health issues of, of vulnerable communities through basically through action research, through an approach that combines the generation of knowledge on what the problems are and the active involvement of, of people themselves in finding um, solutions and processes that can improve their living conditions and, and their health. Um, so for this IPHU, I've been asked to, to give a very short introduction about how we frame the concept of health. Um, and this relates both to my work and to, to the movement, to the people's health movement, and also to this course. Um, and probably many of you are familiar with some of the things that I will say, um, but they are not necessarily the way in which health is conceived by medical professionals and by uh, and also by the by the broad population so many times the when we say health people tend to envision um health care they tend to think that health is equals like hospitals uh, medicines and all that is an intervention to treat a disease uh, but in fact health is much more than that and we refer to uh, a, let's say, a vision that's been developed also within the World Health Organization, uh, which, which gives a broad definition of health as a state of complete physical, mental, and, um, and, uh, psychology and, and, and social well-being. Uh, in saying so, we are saying that health is something positive that happens in people's lives. Uh, and it is not what, what is narrowly conceived as the absence of disease. So meaning that I am free from disease doesn't mean that I am healthy. Um, there's another important aspect to this that says that health is, is multidimensional. It does not only relate with a person's body. And many times when we um, work and operate, especially with health professionals, but also with communities, one tends to think that health is something that pertains to a person's body and that can be measured and judged by an expert, which is the doctor or the nurse or the health professional. Um, we, we actually challenge a little bit this definition by saying that on the one hand, health pertains to different, um, to different parts of our lives that are actually much more intertwined. They're not so divided. We cannot separate our mental state from our physical state, from our social state. We, we are, as, as people, we are a combination of those aspects um, on the one hand. And on the other hand, um, there's a fundamental subjective value attached to health. In another word, um, it's not to minimize the role of technical knowledge. So the, what, what doctors say about health, what nurses say about health is definitely important, but it is not does not capture the whole uh, of what health is. And there is an intimate uh, subjective perception of, of a person who can say whether he or she is in a state of well-being. So why all this is relevant for our, um, also for this, course that we are start starting is that there is um, an approach that's been developed, which is called the social determinants of health approach, which tries to, um, to capture and to sort of classify all the elements that have an influence on our health. So trying to um, elaborate more on that definition of the World Health Organization to make it more concrete and more possible to say, okay, so we say that health is not just the absence of disease, 
it's not something that just pertains to our body that can, can be measured by technical means. It's much more to this. So what, what has to do with our health? And it's surprising to see how much evidence there is about the processes that shape our health. So under the names of social determinants of health, we actually summarize a lot, a lot, a lot of evidence of studies that have shown, for example, how income relates to health, how systematically people who have access to less resources have worse health outcomes, meaning that their life expectancy is shorter, so they tend to die earlier, they tend to become ill earlier for diseases that can be prevented, that can be treated, and they tend to also be treated um, less effectively once they develop the disease. So I mentioned income, but I could mention a set of these determinants, uh, for example, education. So even, even if you equalize the, the level of income, education by itself is a determinant of health. So people who have access to higher degrees of education tend to have a better health and to have um, better access to treatment when they need it. Um, I can mention the area where people live, another predictor of, of worse health. Uh, I could mention, of course, ethnicity, gender, and so on and so forth. So basically, in a nutshell, we say that um, the way in which a society is organized shapes the uh, accessibility of a set of resources, um, housing, employment, education, um, rights. And the way these are distributed in the population heavily um, impacts on the level of health that people can have or cannot have. And um, while this may seem logical, uh, if you look at how money is spent, for example, in research and how we're focused to, to look at the genes, to find, in other ways, we're, we're, we're a bit biased towards finding the predictors of one's health into, into an individual person's genes or behaviors. So, you will have this disease because you have these genes, or you will have this disease because you will behave in this and that way. And there is so much more into understanding why a person uh, will have health problems based on the social circumstances in which this person comes to life and then grows and then uh, lives, works and ages uh, that, that we don't pay enough attention to. And I want to close by saying that this construct of the social determinants of health um, is very relevant for us and also for our work, both with communities and in advocacy, in advocating what we call health in all policies. All decisions that policymakers do have an impact on health, and they should be assessed based on that impact. If it is building a road, if it is um, how to manage uh, waste, if it is how to manage access to education. So, it is important. On the other hand, there's two, two major critiques to this construct that we also are aware of, and that's why we don't limit ourselves to this vision. Um, the one is that this approach, the, there has been a, a critique saying that this approach of the social determinants of health that's being developed by the World Health Organization um, does not say why things are so. It does not say why, okay, so poor people, uh, become more ill and, and die earlier. Why? I mean, why? What is? what are the processes? What are the actors that shape the differential accessibility and distribution of social determinants of health? And so, in other words, the critic is name the killers. This approach does not expose the processes that um, organize such an unequal distribution of, of, uh, of health. And so there is an invitation, especially from uh, Latin American scholars, to speak about health determination. Um, and I don't have the time now to get into this, but maybe we'll uh, indicate some readings about how the, the, the construct of the social determination of health um, allows to move beyond, it's not just listing the determinants, but understanding the processes that are beyond um, the, the distribution, the unequal distribution of, of these determinants. And the other, um, and the other critique is about um, this approach of the determinants of health being organized in silos. So, okay, so let's look at income and the eff effect that in income has, and then education, what's the impact of education, and then gender. Um, while 
we as people will live lives in which we are exposed to a combination of these um, of these impacts and of these trajectories. And so there is an approach that's called intersectionality that um, that helps to go exactly in that direction to understand how the multiple levels of privilege or disadvantage that people have combine to then uh, create um, greater or, 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 or less effects in, in people's health. And um, I think I'll close like that because there is a specific lecture on intersectionality. Um, but I also want to point uh, to the fact that um, there is an aspect of the uh, social determinants of health that in its framework has not been uh, developed so much and that I think is present in the understanding of intersectionality, which is the role of um, agency and movements from the people who are themselves oppressed. I think that in the intersectionality framework, this is captured much more as it is in the Latin American perspective. Um, so from, from a social movements, uh, let's say, point of view, uh, I think these are promising um, fields of, um, of, of thought uh, in which to look at for a, a perspective that's not just descriptive, but it, it is like uh, liberating. It has a potential for transformation towards social justice. Hello, everyone. A very warm welcome uh, to you all to this first session um, at IPHU. I'm really delighted. Um, um, it's unfortunate that we're not in the same uh, room uh, together in the true IPHU spirit, but I am uh, really excited to be able to speak to you about um, looking at health from an intersectional lens and also um, the the chance of engaging more directly during uh, the IPHU. So very, to start off, a very brief introduction from me. Uh, I'm Anuj Kapilashwamy, Professor in Global Health Policy and uh, uh, Health Equity, uh, an academic activist, a feminist, and an interdisciplinary social scientist who's really passionate about health justice and a fairer and equal world. Uh, my work lies at the intersections of health policy, governance and development practice with a very firm focus on social and structural determinants of health and utilizes a gender rights and intersectional equity uh, framework to um, both in research as well as in policy debates. Also, I'm a longstanding member of the People's Health Movement. I joined its inception in Taka. Uh, with other activists from the, in, from the India People's Health Movement Circle and thereafter have been um, involved in the UK chapters and as former convener uh, of People's Health Movement Scotland. Uh, over the last uh, two and a half decades, I have been involved with social movements um, and uh, both health as well as women's movements um, in, in India, in um, the UK and uh, more broadly, South Asia and Europe. So that's a brief introduction from, uh, from me. What I'm going to speak to you today is about uh, the politics of health and in particularly focusing on why an intersectionality lens is necessary to uh, frame health, to understand the um, some of the global health challenges that uh, the world confronts today. In today's talk, I'm going to focus on um, the need for moving beyond silos in understanding health and in um, addressing uh, health and its determinants. Uh, I'm going to start off with introducing intersectionality, what intersectionality really means, what, uh, what are um, the roots of and origins of intersectionality, uh, what are some of the basic tenets and principles of it, and then move on to talking about why does it concern us all? Why, why are we talking about intersectionality um, at, at the IPHU uh, today? And what does that framework offer us? Here, I'm going to use two particular case studies and examples. One is uh, situating uh, the, the discussions about the need for an intersectional lens in the case uh, of uh, 
COVID-19, the differential risk and burden, and what the pandemic teaches us about um, health uh, advocacy, health policy and planning. And the second study is uh, case study is going to look at uh, the um, applies an intersectionality lens in looking at uh, the experience of austerity uh, and activism to resist austerity and its impact on health and access to health enabling resources. And that's going to be drawn from the work in Scotland. I'm going to end with some uh, closing thoughts and reflections about uh, how we move forward, what we need to do differently in tackling uh, some of the intertwined and syndemic crisis that we can, public health confronts today. So just to begin with, um, many of you are familiar with the concept of intersectionality, others may not, but regardless, I, I feel everyone in the room today would have uh, heard the very common and uh, often lose use of the term intersectionality. Uh, so some of the uh, images that I'm showing here, the intersectionality in the last um, decade has had a wide appeal. Uh, from, it has been applied to make reference to uh, the movement of Black Lives Matter. Uh, we see it being used in, in a widespread uh, ways in social media from political um, leaders to, as well as appeals being made to UN and other intergovernmental agencies for adoption of intersectionality. Um, so despite its wide appeal, uh, there are limits in, 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 um, in, in how the, the concept has been applied, framed, and also referred to as. Uh, we hear it as uh, intersectionality as a concept, a theory, or a set of theoretical positions, an analytical tool, a lens, a research and policy paradigm, a methodological approach. To me, in a nutshell, and to some other scholars, essentially, intersectionality is a prism to think of social problems, the contemporary world, and the challenge of inequalities it confronts. It is also a political tool to act on these challenges and bring about social change. Now, in a nutshell, uh, intersectionality concept has emerged um, as a, a notion to, which seeks to revise the view that our social relations are experienced as separate roads. And by looking at the interconnections and the interactions of these roads, it allows us to better understand multiple layers of privilege or advantage and oppression or disadvantage that structure our everyday lives. Understanding health at these intersections and to understand the differences in health status, experiences, outcomes, um, it is critical that we understand the differences in distribution of these oppressions and privileges. And I'll explain um, this, this in further, uh, in, a, in a moment. Uh, just looking at the, the roots uh, of, of the term intersectionality, it was essentially um, the use of the term itself, or the term was coined by um, Kimberly Crenshaw, an American critical legal race scholar, and also a civil rights uh, activist uh, who, was extending a black feminist critique of how anti-racism movements have been inherently patriarchal and how the second wave of feminist ideals were tacitly white and middle class and the experiences the rights and the needs um, of black feminists were uh, were in between the cracks were being ignored as a result of these uh, fairly uh, polarized uh, movements that were not addressing uh, the inequalities that were experienced by differently situated people. Despite the, the term uh, be, uh, and its currency uh, being traced back to late 80s and early 90s and to Kimberly Crenshaw, a lot of us have written about how ideas of intersectionality type thinking have had much longer historic roots. 
It is rooted in black uh, feminist movements and Latina uh, feminism in South Asian, indigenous and queer activists, thinkers, active, um, and, and scholars who have emphasized the complex ways and processes that shape human lives, create oppression, inequity, and privilege. Uh, an example that comes to my mind is work that uh, was done, um, which can actually be seen in parallel to uh, what Crenshaw was referring to and the Black feminist critiques. The work that was done by Sharmila Reggae, Indian sociologist, and several other uh, scholars and act feminists who were looking at the, uh, again, critiquing, looking at the rise and assertion of the Dalit uh, feminist movement as an act of resistance to the anti-caste movements that were very patriarchal and to women's movements that tended to be um, br Brahminical uh, in its ideals, uh, upper caste as well as upper class. So you can see those, those parallels and, and the, that activism and uh, the feminism that emerge can be seen at the intersections of, of um, these experiences. Just to define intersectionality, there are three key um, elements to remember here. Firstly, human beings are shaped by the interaction of different social locations, um, indigeneity, gender, class, sexuality, aspects that are also referred to as social divisions or categories of difference. It's important to note here that the interaction of these social locations are not merely additive. And by that, I mean, for example, the Hegel experience of a Rohingya woman seeking refuge in a neighboring country will not be the sum of the experience because due to her migration status or uh, and of her being a woman and of her uh, being a, of, from uh, the Rohingya community. It is important to highlight here that these interactions are not merely additive, but mutually constitute, constitutive, that they, they interlock, they interact with each other and compound the oppressions or the privileges. So for example, the health experience of being a woman itself would differ for migrants and non-migrants or refugees. That is, gender can be constituted differently by cultural meanings, policies, institutional practices, and aspects of historical violence. Similarly, the, the category of refugee or asylum seeker is often conce conceptualized as a homogenous category and has limits. It needs to be stratified and understood for the uh, differences in livelihood, in class, in migration status, and has to be examined in the context of economic globalization and the changing relationship between state and citizens. So in the migration example itself, we know that uh, despite uh, the, the notion of very static borders, these are very dynamic and fluid. We know that um, certain um, migrants uh, who are privileged of a certain caste of certain livelihoods and certain of a religion are welcomed more with open arms as compared to um, others. So we already see that those experiences of migrants cannot be uh, homogenized. The health uh, outcomes uh, cannot be homogenized for all communities. Now, having given a brief, uh, really a very quick overview of um, intersectionality and this, these interlocking oppressions, what intersectionality also offers is that the interactions are occurring within a context of connected systems and structures of power. And this is the very transformative potential of intersectionality for applying to public health. That the individual experience of health needs to be seen in light of these systems and structures of power. For example, institutions and like the laws and policies, state governments, other political and economic unions, religious institutions, media, and how they uh, frame uh, and, and shape the distribution of risks and vulnerabilities. And through these processes and the broader structural determinants and macro level forces like colonialism, imperialism, racism, ableism, patriarchy, 
independent interdependent forms of privilege and oppressions are created so that in a nutshell is what intersectionality is allowing us to do to situate the individual experiences of health within the context of connected systems um, and structures of power let us look at why that is necessary why does it concern, why does intersectionality concern us all and why in particular intersectionality concerns public health i think the first and foremost example that comes to my mind is the 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 most unprecedented crisis of our times that we uh, that the world is uh, witnessing um that is the intersecting uh, crisis of public health and the case of the covid-19 pandemic now covid-19 was a stark reminder of the a, the interconnectedness of the world we are living in today and of the challenges that the intercon and the interconnections of the challenges that the world confronts so at once fairly early on in the um, when the pandemic hit the world it became clear that what was being framed as a public health crisis or a problem was at once a public health crisis but also a social crisis uh, of relations of uh, caring relationships of um, inclusion and exclusion and of eroding trust uh, in in society and in public institutions it was at once an economic crisis uh, which is evident from the um the loss of gdp in nation states uh, of the significant losses and and um, and heightened rates of unemployment that we are seeing today as well as uh, a political crisis of governance of policies and institutions that are failing uh, it's failing the populations um from both a context of the access to uh, uh protective equipment access to the protection measures um as well as access to essential medication and vaccines uh that concern uh the pandemic what is interesting to note here is that contrary to um what was what the pandemic was being framed as in its its early stage uh why these multiple crises social economic political um crisis of movement and mobility and displacement uh was affecting us all clearly covid-19 was not the great equalizer that it was once portrayed to be there were differential burdens and let us look come to um that now there were differential risks the early set of evidence that we uh, see was primarily focusing on the risk of infection severe illness and death being unequally distributed the early evidence stated age sex um and comorbidities being a, the predominant risk factors what that failed to do and what uh, our policy brief in march uh, 2020 uh, highlighted was that the discussion around these risk factors was not really capturing the disparities in the distribution of risk factors so if we look at beyond these prox uh, proximal uh, determinants we look at um evidence started emerging the how for example these individualized risk factors of cardiovascular diseases diabetes chronic conditions were heightened for certain communities for example the evidence Uh, suggesting ethnic minorities uh, being particularly vulnerable now where data on race and ethnicity started becoming available it was evident that higher rates of covid-19 infection and death were reported among ethnic minorities um, and people of color in the us and uk and in other countries we we saw um uh, i mean uh, the the uh, the issue of increased number of deaths among health workforce and social care workers uh take the proportions of a scandal in in the UK where there was evident um evidence of um doctors particularly from um the minority ethnic uh, groups were at a higher rate of um had higher mo mo mortality as well as 
uh, greater need for ventilators. Now, all the discussions at, this, at that time when this evidence was revealing was highlighting issues with regards to the biology, the genetic factors, the ACP receptors, and much less attention was being given to the structural forms of inequalities and racism that underpinned these and shaped the way they were uh, interacting in healthcare institutions, the, the extent to which they were involved in policy making, and the increased uh, risk of redeployment among uh, this group. Their concentration in uh, more low paying jobs with less authority and um, influence in decision making around PPE and being able to protect themselves. We also found in terms of the differential risk, we found specific conditions, including lack of basic amenities like housing, healthcare, and accessible COVID-19 information place groups like migrant workers and refugees at much greater danger of infection as well as death. Looking at the differential burdens, uh, what, and what we find is um, the impact of containment measures and the policy measures that were adopted to tackle uh, the, the pandemic and its the, 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 the varying impacts had very differential uh, burdens for different people, differently situated people. Um, when we moved, when evidence started going beyond the siloed discussions about sex-based differences, uh, which looked at men dying more versus women having greater care, there were instances of uh, there, there were more evidence which is emerging now around gendered impacts of these lockdown measures the care burden of the pandemic falling mostly on women, but not evenly shared. We can clearly see single uh, mothers, migrant women, those in precarious employment without social security, and women in frontline care in domestic and health work are worse off. We also, um, there was evidence of uh, and reports of increased risk of gender-based violence among women and children. But again, if we look at um, the differences in, uh, and in these impacts, we find migrant, poor and disabled women having less access to resources or support necessary to break that cycle um, of, um, of, of violence um, and, and uh, be able to cope uh, better. Uh, the final point in this context um, of, of COVID uh, is how COVID not only uh, amplified the inequalities that were deeply entrenched in our societies, but also shed light to the these inequalities and the vulnerabilities of particular groups like migrants and refugees. Uh, the reports of um, sudden lockdowns um, leaving millions of migrants and refugees stranded either in detention camps or in countries like India, sudden lockdown measures um, and evictions from home, closure of factory and the informal work sites that they worked in led to migrants making thousands of kilometers journey on foot uh, back to uh, their villages, but were also at once the target of containment measures. There were examples of um, migrant workers being sprayed with disinfectants, uh, cross human rights violations, uh, and none of the policies uh, targeted uh, this particular population group to prevent them from falling deeper into impoverishment. What the, 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 this case with the situation with migrants and refugees in particular highlighted was also the state apathy and complete failure of these universal public health policies and responses. The futility of standard social distancing and isolation me measures, which really do not take into account the specificity and the context of homeless persons, those living in slums, uh, refugees reside in camps and detention centers, who live and work in cramped conditions uh, with access to poor water and sanitation facilities necessary to maintain the hygiene that were being talked about or practice the physical distancing. So when talking about building back better or fairer, we cannot ignore this large section of informal and precarious workers and the processes that are pushing them into those contexts of precarity and um, limiting their opportunities to break out of those. 
I want to now draw attention to the second case study uh, moving beyond uh, uh, COVID. And again, this helps us situate the individual within the wider social and political context and the social system that produces health. And this draws on a, a, a study that on a participatory action research uh, study that was undertaken in Scotland to understand the effects of austerity, the experience of austerity, and how those create differences in uh, health experiences and the access to health enabling or maintaining resources. Now, we all know that austerity um, and its effects have been imposed selectively and unfairly across society, pushing disadvantaged groups further into poverty, deprivation, and ill health. So starting with, with the People's Health Movement Scotland and the um, overall objective of extending the movement and strengthening the movement by linking to uh, communities and by linking uh, the communities to processes of decision making and policy and planning, we conceived of this participatory action research that I led in, in Scotland. There were two components of uh, this, this research. First, to focus on the experiential. So there was an innovative approach which combined intersectional intersectionality with participatory action research and operationalized it in three overlapping phases. What it attempted to do was link the experiential of how people were experiencing, how people from multiply disadvantaged communities and um, sections of the society understand resources that are health en enabling. So how they understand uh, what uh, enables health, what determines well-being, and how they perceive the barriers to accessing those resources to translate into health and well-being. So that was the experiential part, which um, involved drop-in storytelling sessions, focus group discussions, participation in public meetings, truth commissions, as well as mapping participatory mapping of resources and networks available to them in the community. And combine this experiential with institutional level analysis uh, through interviews and group meetings with community initiatives, analysis of policy shifts and, and environment. Um, a preparatory phase helped establish relationships with participant groups, policy stakeholders, and also challenge assumptions that were underlying our research. Fieldwork and analysis was conducted in two phases with a range of participants working in policy and community roles, uh, followed by residents of two localities in Edinburgh, which are high, which experience high levels of deprivation as measured by the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation. Um, of course, traditional qualitative methods were used like interviews and focus groups alongside participatory methods such as health resource mapping, spy diagrams, photo voice, uh, and that facilitated action-oriented knowledge production among multiply disadvantaged population groups. So how did we choose who, did we, who, who we wanted to hear from? Who were these multiply disadvantaged groups? There was a, com there was a, uh, a combination of uh, identity-based groups such as minority ethnic groups and refugees, um, both first generation as well as um, uh, the young um, uh, second or third uh, generation to really look at the diverse context of immigration and immigrant status. We also um, uh, had um, members who were captured at the intersections of different vulnerabilities. So ethnicity, age being one, but also uh, gender and structural conditions. We were, uh, participants were uh, from a mix of homeless, uh, unemployed um, and food insecure contexts. Uh, and recruitment happened through food banks, recruitment happened to uh, walking groups of homeless men uh, and, and so on. What the, the, this long two to three year participatory action research uh, led to was a deepened understanding of how people are perceiving health, how those determinants or resources um, 
that enable health are distributed in their localities and what are the barriers they face in accessing them or utilizing them for good health. This experiential allowed, this, the entry point was people's experiences, their perceptions and understandings of these, what these resources are. A combination of different resources from material, environmental, social, cultural and effective resources were identified by participants themselves from safe, secure housing, reliable income, access to responsive and sensitive healthcare when needed, but also the need for a sense of belonging and of purpose, of the need for feeling valued, issues around self-esteem and effective resources around social networks and, and inclusion aspects. While these were common to all our participants, differences emerged in the value they placed uh, at and the value placed by people at different social locations on these resources. A number of uh, factors emerged. They, the, the, the experiential also allowed us to get an understanding of their views on gentrification of public spaces, of uh, the more securitization of um, banana flats, the, the iconic banana flats and social housing schemes and how they were being increasingly securitized. The, um, the fast food culture, the commercial determinants of health, uh, and how the, the spaces for um, advocacy, mobilization, or even collectivization were shrinking. And these were shared by participants themselves. Uh, the research really highlighted these different conditions and aspects of living their living environment that had affected their access to and ability to translate these resources into healthful living or, or um, into, well, into their well-being. Uh, resources such as job centers were identified as both uh, health enabling, but also health limiting for the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the kinds of, um, uh, the, the kinds of uh, processes and the kinds of exclusion that were inbuilt into the system, the lack of support of particularly marginalized group in uh, securing uh, employment or securing benefits, the, the extremely tedious processes um, within, within job centers, for example, and a number of these factors emerged. The differences were also very evident. The same locality maps and uh, the, the slide uh, shows the differences. The same street uh, and participants uh, from different um, backgrounds identified as highly the, the same street being highly deficient in resources or when not deficient in health enabling resources, uh, then limiting in their ability to access these. So uh, women in particular, both elderly um, uh, white women uh, found as well as the minority ethnic women found uh, limited resources and, public, uh, and limited opportunity to access these public spaces, the green spaces and, and among others. Um, and a number of these differences were emerged very starkly in, in, in this context. Now, why was this research important? And I think it is really important to highlight um, that the, the emphasize on the collective orientation and also the emancipatory potential of the action research and um, aspect of, um, of, of this study, which allowed linking with the movement on health rights. So the wider context was there was an emergent and, and growing uh, uh, health movement, the people's health movement in, in Scotland. Um, and this study allowed engaging with resident population groups in a critical reflexive inquiry uh, which triggered wider processes of planning and social action. It helped participants to reflect on these conditions. We, we employed photo voice, for example, um, and participants to a range of sessions took the images of in, the, the distribution of inequalities in their um, areas and reflected on how those can be acted on. They identified common causes and began to challenge unquestioned uh, developments in the in this in, in the in their society the 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 wider processes alongside the consultations also led to the development of the manifesto the people's health manifesto which identified uh, a set of critical demands under 
key, six key themes, tackling poverty and inequalities, prioritizing health in all policies, health and related public services, improving democratic debate and accountability. The fifth theme was around protecting equality and diversity and sixth on reducing exposures to health risks at work and at home. Now this process of mobilization was, was, was happening simultaneously. And it led to uh, bringing together the voices and the experiences of people who living in these multiple, multiply disadvantaged and precarious contexts with the planning processes uh, to uh, towards the end of end of the study, we had um, a public hearing on the social determinants of uh, mental health and, and well-being, where participants who had uh, of the study itself um, performed uh, through theater and through other arts-based rituals um, in front of they, they narrated their story and their lived experiences of these inequalities of um, the, their health experiences in front of a panel of members. This was done jointly with the Public Health Scotland and, and uh, Scottish National Action Plan for Human Rights and other um, uh, collaborators. Uh, I have I've, I've, uh, placed this link uh, to the video um, that has a short video that has uh, been developed on uh, this public hearing, which highlights how the process culminated into a discussion on thinking about these differences and the inequalities um, and the unfair and unjust inequalities in, that we uh, see in health today. So what have we understood so far? Uh, the three points that I want to highlight from both these case studies. Firstly, first and foremost, siloed thinking is insufficient. Uh, there is an, it is important to understand the, the interconnections of the challenges we face today, the, the uh, syndemicity of the COVID crisis, as well as the crisis of social inequalities, which the Oxfam report has highlighted, has wi even widened um, uh, in the face of the pandemic. Um, the second is the need for collecting and analyzing uh, data and stories on a wide range and multiple uh, wide range of factors. And finally, to explore how these different factors interact to shape the risks and responses to the public health challenges that we are facing today. I want to um, end with uh, reflecting a little bit on what intersectionality is offering and how can we incorporate it. Uh, firstly, we want to reject a predetermined hierarchy of vulnerable groups, a static conception of and a siloed conception of the health problems we face, um, such as you know, looking at gender inequalities separately uh, from um, race inequalities, looking at um, looking at climate change as a distinctive, unique issue not linked to the migration and the displacement crisis uh, as 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 well, uh, and third uh, of the the environmental crisis that we are all uh, sorry the agrarian crisis, the, the trade related uh, issues that are impacting on uh, these challenges simultaneously. Uh, so a universal conception of, of the problem and people's experiences is something that we need to challenge. Intersectionality also allows us to look at risks and impacts that are shaped by these web of intersecting factors, um, which are experienced at individual and group levels, but are shaped by processes and structures of power uh, to create an interplay of oppression and um, uh, privileges. What we need to do is to move beyond these silos, move beyond age or sex collecting age or sex disaggregated data when analyzing the problem. We need to be able to collect diverse data to be able to share and tell diverse stories and contextualize those to the broader political economic context that we're living in. We need to undertake um, an intersectional analysis of responses or policies set in place uh, to identify and prioritize those most at risk. Importantly, we need to move beyond a deficit model when we are planning recovery, when we're talking about uh, building back better, building uh, back fairer and a just uh, world to simultaneously emphasize 
resilience, agency, resourcefulness within these communities and not simply stigmatize and marginalize groups further. And finally, we need to act. We need to act in a way where we are uh, resisting and simultaneously challenging the links between economic, trade, social, and public policies that are undermining access, undermining the experiences of those who are hardest hit, whether it be countries or uh, populations. Just to end, I just want to reflect back on Audre Lorde's uh, word, why we need uh, an intersectional thinking to challenge the syndemic and multiple crises that we are facing today is because there is no such thing as a single issue struggle. We do because we do not live single issue lives. Thank you.